Well, welcome everybody. Thought Leader Friday with our friend Vlad Katz and uh, my ever smart and beautiful sidekick, Debbie, who's here to introduce Vlad. So I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Yeah, welcome guys. So excited to be here and be back on Thought Leader Friday. Um, we've got my great friend Vlad Katz here. Vlad and I met probably, what, six or seven years ago. Yeah. We were traveling the same circuit, building brokerages, and um, have remained friends throughout the years. Um, I've, I've really leveraged Vlad as a mentor to help me in my, my growth, personal growth, and professional growth. So super excited to have you here today. I know I will not tell the Vlad story as well as you will with as much spunk and humor as you will. So Vlad, <laughs> tell all our listeners about you. Who is Vlad? Oh, how many hours do we have for this, Debbie? <laughs> Uh, Carry just, on, as long as you want. just kidding. So look, uh, uh, born and raised former Soviet Union, came to the United States about 13 years of age, uh, did a bunch of, you know, stuff, got myself somehow into college, then somehow into grad school, um, uh, started a, a, a tech firm, uh, United Power Tech, that's still around, uh, got out of that, and then got into real estate. And that'd be like, I was bored. I don't know, like, if anybody has that type of experience, like I was bored and a bunch of buddies of mine, this is in mid zeros, a bunch of buddies of mine were, uh, were flipping homes. And I said, why not? And so we built, we built like a small factory, if you will, of homes back then. And we were doing, you know, buying for 30, putting in 30 grand, selling for 90 to hundred. And we kept it going until, you know, that, what was that thing called? Oh yeah. The market crashed. And yeah. then, and then it kind of like all stopped. Like I remember it just stopped. Okay. By the way, like the way that it's going right now is kind of reminding me of a little bit of that. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about that. Um, but from there, I went into distressed properties. I worked with a real estate fund. We acquired about 300 doors in Baltimore City. Then, um, uh, then I started a short sale uh, processing company, a short sale sales team. We did about 100 short sales. Eh, a little bit over 100 short sales per year. Prior to that, I had, you know, I had my own real estate team that I shifted into, into short sales. And then in 2014, was blessed to be a part of a really cool group that started the first KW brokerage uh, here in my neck of the woods, right outside of Baltimore. A few months later, a few, a few months after the launch, I, um, I uh, raised my hand to become the team leader of that brokerage. And my team and I took it from about 50 agents to about 435 months. That was a wild ride. Yeah. Then started another one, bought a third. And then um, as of about six months ago, I, my career shifted and I'm now at eXp Realty, building, building a nationwide network of top-minded real estate professionals. Uh, personally, married. Kristen is awesome. If you're watching, I love you, honey. And we have three amazing, most of the time amazing little girls. Sloan is 11, Liv is eight, and Reagan, who is the mayor of the house, is four. So does that kind of paint a picture? Yeah, it does. Oh, I forgot. I, and then I owned and ran uh, one of the top expansion teams in the country. Very good. Yeah. But, yeah, I was talking with Vlad before we got on the call, and I was talking about, I have three daughters as well, as most of you know, and um, his are a lot younger than mine, mine being 18, 16, and 12, and I said, you know, just just stay steady with the hair and drama, and once the mayor, always the mayor, just get used to it. My poor husband just sits on the couch with a white flag consistently, and uh, we just, we make it work, you know? You know, Debbie, it's, it's like, oftentimes people ask me, like, how do you remain so calm under stress, and I'm like, dude, I have three girls at home. <laughs> Like, you know, my, my favorite line is when they say, um, you, they start bringing me drama to coaching calls or in my, you know, recruiting and that sort of, you start getting office drama. And I always say, you know what, guys, if I want drama, I'll go home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need it at work too, right? <laughs> well, now with COVID, I can't actually, can't even say that, Debbie. So thanks a lot because I am home all the time. <laughs> well, I know it, it is. You got desk. I got my intro. My foyer is now an off my, and my foyer is now a school classroom, believe it or not. I used to have this cute little table with decorations, and now it's got a desk with drawers and pencil cans and pictures on the wall. So, you know what? We all adjust, and that's what we're doing right now in this crazy 2020. We're adjusting. And so, you know, with that being said, over the past year, we've seen a lot of disruptions. We've seen a lot of distractions. Those are the 
the keywords a lot of people ping on for disruptions, distractions, like you said, the market boom and the bar market crash all in there. So what do you see, what are you talking to your agents about or what are you seeing outside of low inventory? Because I think that's like that catchphrase, oh, it's low inventory. What else is out there that you're seeing that might impact agents markets here in the near future as well as how are they able to overcome those? What, what key pieces should they be putting into place? Well, I think it's, it's look, there is, uh, and I love the disruptions equals distractions and distractions can equal disruptions, right? Like they're very similar terms. Um, it, and look, there is disruptions happen all the time. Oftentimes, like, I'll put it to you this way. My experience in just in the tech world is that when agents, most people, when they say disruption, it's already too late. Like it's already been disrupted. It's, it's kind of like that tornado in the middle of the ocean. And by the time the waves are, you know, six foot high on the beach in South in North Carolina, it's like, it's already happened. These are just the waves. Mm -hmm. So I think that in real estate, we're kind of, as real estate professionals, we're kind of, we're not in the disruption. We're feeling the waves of a disruption, which mm -hmm. could give a kind of a, a different, could potentially give a different mindset. But of what, what I'm seeing right now with real estate professionals is that, um, first of all, they're, they're, I think that there's a lot of really great mindset that's happening, you know, from pivot to shift, things are definitely changing, COVID accelerated a lot of change. But I think that very few people are actually focusing on what's going to happen a year or two from now. Mm -hmm. Well, because the market's so great, Vlad, I mean, I'm doing better than I was now than I was January. Yeah, I, and, I, and that's a really good, that's a really good distraction. That's what typically happens in bubbles. Now, I, I am not here. I'm not a doomsday type of guy. I, I just look at the reality of it. And, you know, if anybody can, can say like, okay, is this sustainable? And they can say yes. Like, you know, I would like to, I would like to have that conversation and see the data, not just, the, not just opinion. So I think that, you know, and, and predominantly what I do now is I, I spend time with the top, like the top real estate associates in their markets. So where, where they have this, you know, unique perspective and what is that unique perspective? One is they have, you know, lead generation systems dialed in, they have people systems dialed in or almost dialed in. I guess those are never dialed in fully, but they, they're experiencing Unlike a solo real estate professional, they're actually able to experience multiple sides of what's going on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a solo real estate professional will say, oh, I need more listings, right? Whereas a, uh, a top producing, somebody who's doing a couple of hundred, 300 units per year, they can say like, no, look, we got listings, but we're underpricing them. What does that mean? Because they're, we're going like way overpriced. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then okay, how do we turn this one listing into four other listings? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're a slightly different conversation amongst different groups. It sounds to me like they're asking their self, um, themselves better questions um, outside of the here and now. Like you said, I need more listings and that's great. You know, listing inventory is low, we get it. But they're asking themselves, like you said, okay, I do have this listing. How are we going to generate four additional pieces of business off of this listing? I have this um, support staff person. How are we going to get this person to generate additional revenue or additional systems for our team? You know, it sounds to me like it's better question asking of themselves and their teams. Uh, a lot, a lot better, Debbie. And, and you know, it, 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 I, I know you do that with your clients. It's, you know, the, the, the job of a, a really great consultant or a coach is to go in and ask a bunch of questions, right? Because mm -hmm. questions expose blind spots. When you really you start thinking about something, you're like, huh, hold on a second. I've never thought about it that way. Or you know what? I've never thought about it, period, which is, you know, forget about it. Uh, it's, uh, it, it can be a really big uh, eye opener. The, the interesting thing that I'm seeing is that when, when any real estate agent is in that swirl, in that rat race, which essentially what, we are, what we're having right now is like, and by the way, I was an economist for Department of Labor, like in my previous life. So I was trained to look at like macro levels. And what we're seeing is like this compression of markets all like in in few months. And then the gasoline of any real estate market is the interest rates. It's free money. 
right? But so nobody, everybody's running, showing houses, which is awesome, okay? But they're not relating to it like a squirrel would relate to like collecting the nuts and putting them in the ground, right? <laughs> uh, getting ready for winter, which yes. is which is kind of like, you know, during the bloom season, that's what's happening. Or right. bears, you know, <laughs> I know, these probably are weird like analogies. <laughs> I'm looking at Bill's face and Bill's like, bears, squirrels. He's so, from South Carolina. Thanks a lot, Vlad. Right. This is Thought yeah. Leader Friday, not like zoologist. Well, I, I, I think you were about to add that to your resume as well. You're a tech guy, you're an economist, you've run real estate firms. What have you not done, man? <laughs> with, with little <laughs> girls, we watch, a lot, yeah. we watch a lot of animal stuff, right? <laughs> so, like Daniel Tiger, for example. Right. Um, uh -huh. And it's, uh, you know, when you relate to it, let's cultivate as much as possible because something is happening. Well, now something is going to happen, whether it's six months from now, whether it's three months from now, like it is what it is. It's just not sustainable. But then you're you're in a different mindset. And I don't see and hear that mindset. It's like we've, we, uh, by the way, Debbie, we definitely forgot 2008 and Bill, like we've, for, as an industry, and it's not surprising because most of the industry players right now came in after that time. So they don't even have the recollection. They have it like a memory, like, oh yeah, World War II did happen. I saw it on pictures, <laughs> right? They didn't experience it. So it's a different mindset, but man, whew, that mindset is what helps you get through the next and the next and the next, and the next. All right, I digress. So let's, let's, let's actually, I think this is a brilliant point you're making. So let's stick on this for a second. Because one of the things Debbie and I talk about a lot and, and our other coaches and our clients is that um, there are a lot of folks in the industry right now who didn't get punched in the mouth in the last downturn because they weren't in it. And that's not a criticism, that's just an observation. People were right. doing different right. things. And so uh, two part question. Number one is if I was not in the business then, which I was, however, if I was not, what advice would you give me? And then if I was in it and I have that recollection and I want to be really prudent as I move forward over the next 12, 18, 24 months, what would you advise me to do? So I'll answer your, your first one first. Um, and that would be, if you have not been in the last downturn, go talk to five people who have. And just get, and like get really real with like, all right, what was it like? And then collect those points of data so you can start looking for it. Like, look, I remember like back then I was flipping houses and I remember this one house in Dundalk, Maryland, okay? Where we were like, it, it, we had, I think we had it listed for like 270, okay? And the offer came in at like 268. And we were like, no, we want full price. Like it was something like, that right now you can, I'm considering silly. And we like, we literally did not make it happen over like 1% or something, okay? Or like some weird, like some term or something. And then Monday hit and we started hearing these like rumblings. We sold that house for like 234 a month later. And it took everything to sell that house. So it's like, once you start hearing these stories, you start looking out for that type of stuff. Like I have, you know, uh, buddies call me like, who are like practicing real estate, like here in Baltimore. It's like, hey, what should I do? Like, you know, the buyer is, is giving me a hard time. I'm like, look, do whatever you can. You're selling it at like a peak peak. Figure out, like, I know that they have like 50 points on that inspection. Figure it out. Do not lose it right now because you don't know what's going to happen a month or two from now you just don't so that that's the that's the first part the second is how do i prepare myself none of this is going to be new first i start with the mindset something's going to happen but not like from a fear perspective it's just a reality like sun is going to go down so like if i operate as if sun is always up like you know i'm going to be in trouble because there's going to be dark and like, I'm going to need a flashlight or I need electricity. Like, it, no, like sun, sun is going to go down. So you, you, we've already taken precautions for that, if you will. So like the next 18 or 24 months, I would be sucking money away. Okay. Now, not necessarily just like cash, because, you know, if we get into macroeconomic trends and potential inflation that may be a coming, then that's a, that's a different conversation. 
but I would be putting money away, cutting expenses, figuring out what I can cut fast, unlike let's say a Zillow contract, if it's a 12 month contract, right? And, fit, and, and getting myself prepared. One of the things that I learned from wealthy individuals, this may have been even like in, in, in leadership at the previous company, I, I'm sure it was, it's, it's operate as if you're in the next phase of the market. And it, nobody can disagree that we're at or around the peak, right? Like, I mean, yeah. Like, so just a question whether we're on one side or the other. I, I hope that answers, Bill. Yeah, 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 definitely does. Yeah, I, I look at it too, Vlad, like you're saying at or near the peak, you know, we we're seeing in our, I was in the market, I got in the industry back in 2002. And, you know, we were seeing the 2000s, I was in Orlando, so we saw 2006, 2007, that really strong peak. And um, we're, we are above that now and what homes are selling for from what they sold for in 2006 and seven. So these people that even bought at the peak are able to get out and have equity, right, that they didn't pay for. So, you know, for those people that are going, oh, let me see what next spring brings. Again, I'm not preaching, but probably if you're looking at next spring, that's only six months. Let's go ahead and make some changes, right? Yeah. You know? I, I, it's it's weird. Look, there is uh, I my wife sent me my, my wife sent me the podcast today, uh, London London Real with Robert Kiyosaki, and Robert Kiyosaki just put out a new book called Fake. Talks about fake money, uh, fake teachers, fake assets. Uh, so it was a preview of the book, uh, and it's clear that that the the waves of macro economy are are not favorable the only question are not favorable to most <laughs> i <Okay>. should say because <laughs> there's a lot of people who will benefit and we want to start positioning ourselves uh so that to, to add to your you know the second question bill is want to position yourself to take advantage of the next market because there's always the next market you just yeah. rarely take advantage of that if you just caught flat footed yeah right. yeah yeah. Uh, one more quick thought or question on the market, and then we can transition into some of the next key points that Debbie has. And, and I'd like for you, if you don't mind, to, to delineate from your perspective, the differences that you see between 2006 through 2010, depending on what market the listeners were in, and today, just so they're clear that, that we're not saying that they're the same. Um, we're saying, though, that we are at or near a peak and that we should be mindful of what lives on the other side of that. Yeah, no downturn. Like it, it, it's, it's interesting you say that, Bill. Like in the last six months, I what I've been studying are uh, I've been looking at I, I've been looking at, and I'm a cash flow quadrant fan. Sure, Yasaki's book, right? And I'm focusing, and I'm a freedom guy, freedom chaser, if you will. So freedom exists in the I quadrant. The question is, how do you get there? And so what I've been studying, and I've been actually talking to, to a lot of friends who know a lot more about the investment arena and macroeconomy. So I've been, I've been looking at like, what do really seasoned investors look at? And then what causes a crash? And no two crashes are caused by the same thing. Okay. So in 2008, one of the things that caused it was just total like relaxation of rules how money can be made in mortgages you know you could trace it back to 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 signatures by former presidents uh on like who can buy a house what does fha mortgage look like what does fannie and freddie what do they look like where are the incentives and all of that stuff so it was essentially it was a lot of greed that and and by the way everybody was involved in it it's not just wall street okay they just ended up making the most money from it. So that was my uh, evaluation is that that's what caused that, like, because people were buying houses that were not supposed to be buying houses. And then on top of that is all of those mortgages were packaged into something that nobody should be buying or selling. Right. But because transaction fees keep rolling in, it just makes sense. Sure. What we're experiencing today is something completely different. What we're experiencing today is a, is a, is a combination. It, it actually stems back from 71 when Nixon um, took us off the gold standard 
And we, you know, U.S. dollar went from a, a banknote to a uh, to a currency, a fiat currency, to be more exact. And and it, it allowed the U.S. government and other governments around the world just to keep printing money. So how did we get out of 2008 recession? Is U.S. government just printed a lot of money, but it catches up to you. So right now, what we're experiencing, COVID just facilitated it to, to happen a lot faster, like the, the run-up. So now we're printing a lot more money. So what's inevitable is once you keep printing money, something has to happen. Either inflation goes through the roof or, de- or it all goes bust and deflation hits it, sets in. Where And I, I think we're getting too, too deep into that. So it's two different- You're not getting too deep for, for me. I, I, we could talk about this stuff all day. All right. However, uh, we might be losing some people out there right yeah. now. Sorry, I interrupted myself. My bad, Bill. So there no, are two different good. things. This one is, is being caused by too much available money. Like think about it, like two and a half for a 30 year fixed, 275 for a 30 year fixed. Right. <laughs> you can't even get a car loan for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, sorry and, about that. I just no, well, that. I mean, you, you make a great point there because it was more printed money than the entire uh, GDP for the quarter. So um, anyway. And, uh, and by the way, when you look at when you look at the history, it's like there's been more money printed in the last decade than there there's been ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right, Debbie's calling a thirty-second timeout so we can change gears because uh, we, we might be we might be here a while otherwise. All right, Debbie, let's change gears. What do you want to talk about next? Yeah, no. Vlad brought up a really valid point when we were talking about his children and how he's now virtual and at home and just like everyone else is, and we're seeing that across the board, even with our large teams, where they're having to go virtual with their agents, they're having to change standards, accountability, motivation, and even keeping that team culture alive. All, of, all while still working to build that business. What are you seeing out there um, from that perspective? What are you seeing with your communication of your top agents that's working? How are we keeping people moving in the right direction instead of being on the chopping block because they're not doing their job? You know, it's... <laughs> so as leaders, pre-COVID, we relied, we relied too much on site and proximity. Today, we actually have to rely on KPIs. So like think of, and by the way, I fell into that trap myself. And I was, pre-COVID, I was an office guy. I swore by the office, I'm like, get people in the office, like, unless you're sick, you're coming into the office, I don't care how far you are, like I was that like dictator. And what I realized is that productivity, the productivity of people who worked with me was a byproduct of me seeing or hearing them. Which is, by the way, like if you know your, your watchers, listeners, they think about it like, okay, how do you know somebody is doing a great job? Well, you usually go to like, well, they come into office every day at 8.30. They lead generate and they script practice. Well, how do you know that? I see them. You know, they're talking to buyers and sellers all the time. They just met with four buyers. How do you know that? I was in the office. Okay, like it's sight and proximity. Well, guess what COVID did? It's like, unless you put a camera in somebody's room, which would be like violation of probably like 15 like codes of something, right? It's like, you don't know. So you actually have to lead through management. And that, that comes down to numbers. And so like, okay, how do you get people to report the numbers? Well, if they never reported the numbers, good luck. You're going to be now, you're going to be in a guessing game rather than a visual game. So it's kind of like, you know, when you're in the dark, one of your senses is off, your eyesight is off. So you have to like, your smell enhances, your touch me, like all of that stuff. So that's what a lot of leaders are being forced to do in this virtual environment. Because you can't see and you can't feel the people. Now, the flip side of that is that we're pack animals. I cannot imagine being alone in my house for months. Like I, you know, luckily I have enough drama and you know, my wife here. So like at least it's entertainment and I get my, you know, serotonin or oxytocin levels, you know, and I hug and, you know, play with my kids. But like, if you don't, then pe- that's how people fall into like, you know, they become depressed. 
So then as a leader, you have to watch out for that as well, because you, you are responsible for their well-being, at least their financial well-being. So again, it has to like, you have to start looking for signs that you've never looked for before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all while in the dark. So yeah. you, you mentioned KPIs, and I, I know what KPIs are, but I'd love for you, for our listeners, to, to define KPIs and what are some of those metrics that you're putting into place or that you're seeing top agents put into place if they are in that boat of, we never really did a high level accountability because we could see it. What are some of those indicators that they're there? You know, I probably would not be like the, the, the best guy. Like uh, one of my buddies, Sean, is like a CISU guy and he's got everything on there. So like I see a lot of teams going to these types of like easy to input metrics from a number of contacts, right? Because, because look, there in it, when it comes to key performance indicators, there's leading and lagging, right? typically we know we're doing good when there is money in the bank. Well, that's so lagging that it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not even in the conversation or closings or pendings. Those are really easy to measure, but how do you, how do you predict how many you're going to have when COVID was starting? It was like, everything was out the window today. Everything is in the window because of how hot the market is. Right. But normalize the market and you have to actually predict your business if you're running like a business. So, I mean, just some real basic ones is, you know, conversations had appointments set, it, you know, no, nothing is new. The question is, and look, this is yeah, like, I remember from running brokerages is uh, working with a lot of real estate agents is, is oftentimes can be like hurting cats. Right. And, you know, if there are any real estate agents watching, I apologize. I'm just kidding. I know that there's real estate agents watching, but sometimes it's like hurting cats. Uh -huh. Right. Because, look, accountability, account of, we often look for accountability in a person. Here's what I learned about accountability. Two things. One is um, number one is you cannot make anyone accountable. They're either accountable or they're not. Number two is it's about accountability systems and whether or not people are using it. And then you can see who's accountable, who's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that well, helpful? I think, no, it's super helpful. Uh, we lost Debbie's feed for a second. She'll be back with us in a little bit. So let's tie this though to a topic that that um, we covered in, in the call prep for this. And let's kind of transition this into uh, the, the leadership team building element of things. So you can take that in any direction you want. And, and the, the reason I'm sort of bringing this topic here is the vast majority of people that we coach, uh, and I would assume most of the people on this, are either in the process of building teams or running teams. And so uh, take that in sort of the direction of uh, both maybe self-leadership and leadership of others and, and what you've seen to be the best practices there. Oof, I mean, Bill, that's such a, such a wide open question. Right. I, think, I think that, and I, I'll kind of start with, uh, with this, with, with just a learning of my own through this journey is um, there is there is a lot of pressure on growth. There's a lot of pressure on business growth. And there isn't enough, there isn't, and it, and many people are not responsible just for the converse. It's going to sound weird, Bill. It's, All right. it's, I'm, just, I'm trying to be nice. Um, don't, don't worry about being nice. Just say what you, you can say what you need to say. Okay. So so look, growth for growth's sake is a waste of time. Right. Most real estate professionals, and I think most business owners or most practice owners, sales practice owners, are uh, are in uh, have an affinity for just growth. Right. And and then you have this uncontrolled. Um, uncontrolled, unbounded, it's not even, it, it's for a sake of what? Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, when you start with an end in mind, as cliche as that sounds, and you understand what does that actually mean? And like, what does your business need to look like in order for you to create the life for you, for your children, for your future generations, or for your communities, what does that look like? Then growth becomes a function of that. Sure. Okay. So I think that one of the recommendations I would make um, is like, look, if you're building a business, if you're hiring people, start with, okay, growth in order for what? 
Okay. And then another thing is uh, I had a really great coach when I was in production myself and he taught me like, because I came to him and I was like, all right, I want to build a team. I want to build the biggest team in Maryland. And he was like, all right, Vlad, do you want to build a team or do you want to build a business? And I was like, hmm, you're right, Tony. Like, I want to build a business. And then the team becomes a function of that. See, right. oftentimes I think, actually, I'll, I'll leave it at that because I want to get through some more questions. Well, you make such a great point, and and maybe we can hang here for a second because I, I think we see this a lot in the industry. And what you're saying is very much in line with the way that we approach this. Is we come into it from this point of view that that everyone is is aspiring to reach what we refer to as their freedom of choice moment, and that's just the day at which they wake up and say, "I get to choose today. Do I go to work or do I not go to work? And if I want to work, I do it because I like it. And if I don't and I want to go fishing, I go fishing. And I've I've built a business that allows me to do that." And then everything rolls backwards from that. And we just think it's super dangerous that everybody starts looking at uh, sort of faux leaderboards um, and, and chases those without regard to why the hell they're doing it to begin with. So, uh, so what you're saying resonates really, really well with us. So let's say I'm sitting at home right now and, and I'm thinking, all right, I got that part figured out. I know why I'm doing this. How do I go find some of the best people to align myself with? So you, you've been consistently... Uh, one of the, the one of the top recruiters in the entire real estate business. So how do you attract talented people to your organization? Good. All right. Glad to answer that. So um, let me just go one half a step back. Yeah. So it's, when somebody is looking for growth, my invitation for for them is to actually define growth of what I think that you, you kind of implied it, Bill, is, you know, in this industry, there's hyper focus on the top line right. and top lines rarely rarely transcend into bottom lines in this right. particular industry right. in most industries yes especially publicly traded businesses those have to align uh, for, for shareholders uh but in the real estate businesses oftentimes and you know in an expansion world i looked at a you know a lot of pnls it just it it's not a direct correlation so my recommendation is profit growth because yeah. that's what gets you to freedom of choice moment. Right. And it's funny, I call it like in, in, in our network, we, we actually have freedom Fridays, which is today that I lead and we yeah. have a freedom number. Uh huh. Right. Uh -huh. It's the, so it's the, that the number that allows you to get to time freedom where yeah. you, where you can do anything that you want with anyone that you want at any time that you want. There you go. So I'm so glad that you coach you your clients on the on on the same thing. So now, all right. So there's there is uh, uh, when we when we talk about recruiting or or grow like growth of numbers of people on the team, right? And by the way, just because you have a lot of real estate agents on your team does not mean that you have high profitability. So I want right. to like dissect that. Say that uh, again, so they can everybody can hear that one more time. Yeah, just number number of real estate agents on your team. Does not e does not have to equal your profitability, which is actually the profitability number is what gets you to the freedom of choice day or freedom of choice number. Okay, now so um, w when we're looking at uh, recruiting, there is the, what's collapsed right now in the industry is uh, the the context for recruiting. See, when you are running a brokerage, it's very different than when you're running a real estate team. And here's how I kind of like the best, a way that I've found to explain it. So as a brokerage owner, and do you have brokerage listeners? Or should we just focus on it? We do, yeah, yeah, we got that. So if you're a brokerage owner, you are the mayor of the city. Kind of like my you know, youngest daughter, mayor of our household. Like you're the mayor. So if you take, if you take, if you become a mayor, how do how do local governments get paid through taxation okay so as a broker owner you're the mayor and you collect tax from your agents quote unquote tax that's sure. where the company dollar comes in so you're like are there any mayors in the world that would say don't come into my city <laughs> no it'd be clear. weird because right. yeah. every every mayor in the world wants to increase their tax base Okay. Now, 
what I'm seeing, which is like, I'm like dumbfounded by that oftentimes <laughs> is when real estate team owners put on a mayor hat and just bring everybody in, bring everybody in, bring everybody in. Right. Because as a real estate team owner, you're actually a business owner inside of a city and you are not increasing your tax base. You're actually paying people to be on your, to be on your team. It's kind of like employees, but without, you know, the, the legality of it, because everybody's an independent contractor typically. Okay. By the way, side note, when I ran my short sale business, it was all W-2s. It was all W-2, no salespeople. Okay. Maybe a different conversation. So it's a, uh, so when you put on a hat of an employer, you're paying people. So do you want as many employees as possible? Like, do you ever have like a business owner or an employer say like, man, I just need to hire a bunch of people. How's your business? Don't worry about it. I'm just going <laughs> to like, we just need to hire a bunch of, yeah, but like, how's your profit? Dude, we're just going to go hire, but you're paying them. Dude, right? it's, it's going to be good. Like I got <laughs> this. Like it, I, I know I'm making it humorous yeah, just to exactly. drive home kind of the point. But when, when you have a team owner whose focus should be profitability, just like any business owner, it's not about hiring as many people as possible. It's about creating the biggest bottom line possible. Now, here's the, here's the thing is in the real estate industry, team owners rarely pay sales agents. They, you know, there's, you know, aside from Redfin, there's nobody doing W-2s, right? So they think that because it's a, they don't have to pay them, then right. they're actually not paying them. But guess what? Yeah. You know that they're paying them in time, energy, opportunity cost, a hundred leads sent that you paid for, you know, a 10 or 20 bucks a lead that you sent to somebody who ignored it right. is a cost, is a real yes. cost. So you are paying them. So, all right. So that's the, the dichotomy. Now right. on the real estate brokerage side, it's, it comes down to the number of agents. Okay. Now you have to provide a, an environment for a productivity, a culture of productivity. Okay. So it's kind of like in the, in the mayor's example, it's, you got to make sure there's not a lot of crime right? Or no crime. And that, you know, there are good schools and stuff like that. But people sure. go in and out. The mayor of the city is not going to go in and say like, Bill, like, how come your kids are going virtual? We need them in. Or like, how come like your kid got to be on the exam? Like, we, like, let's like, it'd be weird. Okay. So there is this, you know, there's this distance. So you create the environment, then you bring as many people as possible. Like Debbie and I did that, you know, fairly well in our previous system, right? Like, and then, and then that equates to profitability because the higher the tax base, the higher profitability. Right. Okay. Now on the team side, it, it's not about the numbers. It's actually about productivity. Right. So it's, so instead of 20 people who are doing two transactions a year, like how about you have five people who are doing 20 transactions a year? Or something like that, right? Like whatever. By the way, they're going to stay longer. Now, here's what I learned in rec in recruiting both to teams and to brokerages. There is one reason people. There is there's many reasons, but there is the there's a the most important reason why people, um, real estate professionals or otherwise, why they join your organization. And it's the top one is to reach their financial goals. How do I know that? Well. If you have, if you have a, an assistant who loves working for you, like she loves you or he loves you, like they, they work seven days a week, 12 hour days. See how long they last once you stop paying them. <laughs> I know it's silly, but like most, mo most broker owners and team members forget about it. So the first question is, what is your financial goal? And then that person starts associating you with the environment that's going to help you reach that financial goal. Are there other things? Culture is important. Absolutely. I'm not saying culture is not important, but here's what I do know. There's a lot of Americans right now who are working in poor cultures. True. So 
Culture is important. It's just not as important as making money. And as a business owner or as a broker owner or as a team owner, we might as well just talk about it right away. By the way, the reason people, the reason people leave your organization also learned it a while ago and experienced it all over the place. Two reasons people leave your organization. Reason number one is don't, they don't reach their financial goals. That's like the fastest way to lose somebody. Number two, most don't get there, but number two is they do reach their financial goals, but they don't associate their success with your environment. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So as a, if I'm listening to this and I'm gonna like shut up and you know let you know, breathe and ask another <laughs> question, but it's like, if you're listening to this is, the question I'd be asking is, do I know my people's goals? And the answer is no, go find out. Just go find out. Yeah. Well, you're, you're hitting on another um, key point of the way that we approach this. And I'm going to hand it to Debbie for a couple more questions before we wrap up. As we see so many businesses sit on high with some goal and then force it down the organization, as opposed to asking the goals at the, at, at the lower levels of the organization to add them all up and make sure they align with the goal at the top. And yeah. We, I, we, all, we all have been in that position before. Yeah, I used to say that, look, the only thing you can discriminate in hiring is goals. Mm -hmm. Like you could be sitting with a, let's say I have a goal of doing 100 transactions a year and I know I'm not going to do it. So I'm going to, I'm going to bring on five real estate professionals, five agents doing 20 transactions each. And somebody comes in and says, my goal is 10. They could be great, but it doesn't fit with my goal. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to adjust my goal for somebody else's. Right. And it just creates weird dynamics on the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. All right, yeah. Debbie? Yeah. Debbie, what you got? <laughs> Welcome back. No, I think this is great um, because again, it goes back to that knowing your people, right? Knowing what they're looking for specifically and making sure that you're able to provide one, the tools and systems for them to reach those goals, right? That's, yeah. that's value. But then what would be some other ways that they could help tie back success to their, their team, right? So you're right. You do have agents that say that typically why they leave teams, they're hitting their goals and they say, well, none of this has to do with anything that you're doing for me. I can go do it on my own. Yeah. So what, are, what do we as team leaders or business owners need to be doing or providing or saying or communicating to our people so that they can start to correlate those two things together? We actually need to point to that. Like, Do you like really tell them, like have a conversation? Well, I mean, look, it's, uh, it's, it's not like a conversation, like there's, you can make a conversation about you and here's what it will sound like. Uh, so I'm you, I'm saying, Debbie, I'm so glad it, like it, it, that you're winning just to let you know you're winning because of me. <laughs> like tell your husband that like, you know, you guys are lucky that you're with me. Congratulations. We're good. That, like, I mean, that, I wouldn't say that, yeah, sure. right? And, sure. and I'm not thinking that, but see, when, when, when I look at any successful organization, it's actually a, a, some form of a partnership because I take the perspective is when it's like Zig Ziglar's approach, when I help enough people get what they want. And like the way I say it, when I help enough people get to their goal, I'll get to mine, right? So then... It, the partnership you and me is, is I'm helping you reach your goal so you can help me reach my goal. So it would be a conversation like Debbie, like, oh my God, like you had a goal of 20 transactions this year. You're about to close your 21st. Thank you so much for the opportunity for me that you provided for me to like, and using all of our systems to reach that goal. Like, I'm really proud to have you in this organization because I really am. Like if I'm, if I'm making it about your goals, that will help me reach mine. Mm -hmm. See, it's, 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 we, we talked about earlier is that level of authenticity. Yeah. It's like you can see right away, like when a team leader is after themselves or whether they're there to help people. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with being about themselves. You just have to be real upfront and honest about it. Like right. you're a cog in my machine, but I'm gonna pay you really well. And, yeah. you know, and I'm gonna create a 401k for you so you can never leave. And you just be, have to be all right with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's called the golden handcuffs, right? We've, we've experienced those in, in, in times too. Many of us out there have. Um, when you think about those, 
the goals and accountability, right? So I always say without action, a goal is a wish, right? <laughs> yeah. so, um, now we're starting to see where, where agents are experiencing success and we are having to go to a different level of accountability because we can't, can no longer see the number of agents coming in or buyers or sellers coming in and that sort of thing. And so we're, we're clamping down a little bit on accountability where that's coming back as micromanagement. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a recovering micromanager, so <laughs> it's a, that's an easy conversation. So look, micromanagement is not about them. Micromanagement is about me feeling secure, feeling safe. Accountability, uh, it's like I mentioned earlier, look, somebody's either accountable or they're not. That's it. Like you're not going to make anybody accountable. The best that you can do is you can make someone or enroll someone or entice someone or incentivize someone to use your accountability system. So here is, here's an example of incentivization, negative incentivization to use an accountability system. Bill, unless you use our CISU track, I'm not affiliated with CISU, but the second time I'm mentioning it, unless you're using our CISU tracker, you will get zero leads. Okay. Now you're seeing what the person is doing or not doing. So you just, the, 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 my experience is that the best thing to do with leadership is just practice it. But you have to be like this open-minded leader where when you see the conversation not going your way, don't make it about the other person. Make it about your ineffectiveness in that conversation. My good buddy, business partner, uh, Devin Doherty talks about this a lot. Is like, is he, I don't remember exactly what he says, but um, he kind of like takes away this, this right, wrong, and he puts an effective, ineffective. So if I'm having a conversation with you about, about your performance, Debbie, and you walk away like not empowered, that's not on you, that's on me. And I just had an ineffective conversation. So as leaders, we have to start paying attention to how are we leaving our people and make it about us. Yeah, that's great. Well, I want to lean in a little bit on your recruiting um, experience and um, have you, because one of the questions that we get or, or topics that we cover quite often are, um, you know, the ideal candidate for teams. And you mentioned the, the higher producing mm -hmm. um, agent versus the agent that's going to do 10 deals a year. How are we going out? How are we coaching our, not, I guess, not how, but when you think about that ideal candidate, where are you going to find those people? And what do those conversations look like coming from someone who probably recruited over 500 people to an organization? Are you, I, I want to say, yeah, I mean, we, yeah. we yeah. were, yeah, we were, we were, how many did we, probably the bad, that okay, thousand or something like that, but it's, yeah. um, um, so two things. First is the, the definition of that ideal agent profile is so important. So many people, like Bill and Debbie, you'd be surprised. People ask me about like, all right, how do I, how do I have that conversation? And that's really important. But the most important conversation is conversation with yourself. Okay. So I, I don't give out scripts and, you know, I may like say something that's scripty, but it's uh, once you're crystal clear on your IAP, Okay, the ideal agent profile, suddenly they start opening up, like they're, they're, they come from everywhere. So depending on the value prop of the team and brokerage, you can you know, exchange those words as you see. Uh, once you're clear on the value that you provide, you then work in the uh, ideal agent profile based on that value. So for example, if my value is uh, leads, okay, let's just say, well, then I would want somebody who values that value. So my ideal agent profile may be somebody who's brand new, okay? Or somebody who's only been working with buyer agents and loves working with buyer agents because I know that most of my internet leads are going to be buyer specific. So then you're actually tailoring your value prop to them, okay? And, and how does that translate? Well, in your job post, you're going to be talking directly into somebody who's going to value your value proposition. Like there's so much focus right now happening on leads that I think that that word gets devalued as an example, right? 
or like on the job training, like people like now need to be hearing it as if like they don't even value that anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. And so for, for real estate team owners, get clear on the com first conversations with yourself. What is my value proposition? Then you write out the ideal agent profile that's gonna value your value proposition. And then you turn that into a conversation and you use that as a screener. See, when you have a, when you have a mindset of I'm a business owner versus mindset of I'm, I'm a mayor and growing my tax base, you use all of that as a filter, not as a magnet. Use it as a detractor. Oh no, I don't work with leads. Okay, then it's not a fit. You can go to somebody else's team. Good. All right, I'm gonna stop. No, I love that. I love that the first conversation is a conversation with yourself because I think yeah. that where um, you know a lot of our teams as they're growing, the value of their team is also growing. Yeah. And having them be able to communicate the additional value that they're pouring into the team one to the team members. So the team members see, hey, here, here's three different things that we did this year to help you grow in your success. And now let's go deliver that to the, the masses or this yeah. production population or something that then, again, helps us understand the value. Because a lot of times as, as agents, we get so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, I got to do another sale, another sale, another sale. We're not stopping to look at what value do we truly provide to someone. And I think, honestly, I think business owners discount the value that they bring like on the job training, how can, you know, looking at that further define that, right? You don't go anywhere and not have on just on the job training, but what is it about your, your specific on the job training that you provide? I know for our clients, we developed a listing skills course, a buyer skills course, and a digital marketing skills course. So a lot of our teams are offering that as on the job training. That is not, that is not just, Hey, you can shadow me for six weeks and then I'll give you your first client. It's very specific benefit driven conversations is what makes a difference for people mm -hmm. very specific benefits driven it's like how is this going to benefit me in reaching my goals mm -hmm. that's so that's so great like yeah that's so great and you and you also pinged on something else too is it's okay to say no if that 10 10 10 um transaction agent comes into your world and that's not in your iap let them go let them be okay with saying that person's not for me. Yep. Because you're, you're hot. It's like when you take the approach that you're paying people, whew, it's going to be, it's going to, you're going to have a high screen. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, Bill, I'll let you wrap it up. What, what last question do you have for Vlad? Uh, well, I think Vlad, I, I'll turn it back to you by saying if you were to offer a, a single piece of advice or multiple, if you want to, because we've got a few minutes left here. Uh, advice to the listeners on what they should go take action on now, what would that be? Woo. Action on now. So one thing I would do is I would, I would, you know, if they're, if they're not with your coaching company, I would, I would call you guys like for one specific reason. Like if I'm you, I'm calling Bill or Debbie and saying, okay, take me through that. What'd you call it? Freedom choice, freedom of choice, the freedom of choice. Yeah. The freedom of choice because like yeah. look that is brilliant you see i believe that that business owners are most i don't want to make a blanket statement but business owners people who are getting into real estate business or any business once you ask them enough questions so why are you doing this why are you doing this why are you doing this right why is that important to you you'll get to some kind of a uh, answer that has the f word in it Mm -hmm. right the freedom word right yeah <laughs> the other like, one too sometimes yeah all right so it's it's like once you if that is the reason why we're in business and i believe that the purpose of the business is to, is to is to support that great lifestyle or that great life and by the way lifestyle doesn't mean like luxury on the yacht it, it's like could be given to congregations churches etc right like it's sure. up to a person so yeah like starting there is, is a gift because during the hard times, like during the easy times, like a lot of real estate professionals experiencing right now, it's easy to get through things. But during the hard times that were there and will probably, it will, will definitely be there in, ahead. It's like, what's going to get you through it? I believe it's going to be that number and the word freedom tied to it, not just for you, but your family. So that would be like, that's a no brainer. 
Awesome. <laughs> That's Thank a no-brainer. And then the other thing that I would say is like, all right, figure out what are you going to do like in the next three, six months to grow yourself. And I know it's kind of, we kind of talk about this a lot, uh, like growing yourself, by the way, it also is getting diluted, that whole growth mindset. And I pay attention to language, like, um, you know, being an immigrant, the, whatever, I'm not going to go into detail there, but I pay attention to it and like word, like opportunity is diluted already. Mm-hmm. Like growth also, it's like, oh yeah, everybody's growing. Everybody, it's like, we don't inspect it. But my recommendation is get really clear with your coach on like, what does growth actually look like for you? Like individually, do not buy into the herd mentality. Yeah. So those are, yeah. those are the two things that jump out, you know, Good we, stuff. we talked about so many things already. So, yeah, we covered a ton of ground today. A lot of great stuff. Debbie, what would you, uh, what would you leave us with? Or you want to go ahead and wrap us up? Yeah, I think I'd love to wrap us up. I think, first of all, Vlad, thank you again so much for your time. Your wealth of knowledge and information has been, I'm sure, proven valuable to many of our listeners. And as this goes out um, through our Facebook pages, I'm sure many more will take advantage of what you have to offer. So um, if you're ever in what Baltimore, go check Vlad out and um, yep. say so uh, connect with him. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Vlad. Good to see you, my friend. The same here, Bill. Debbie, th- thank you for the opportunity. Bill, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, Definitely. Good to see you. See you soon. Bye. Bye.